Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. My name's Gabrielle russell and I'm from the National Centre for Cultural Competence, and we've organised tonight. Um, we're going to um, just wait for Mikey to run back to the lectern, um, because we're going to start with um, playing a Welcome to Country from Uncle Chicka Madden um, as part of the Aboriginal Sydney MOOC, and then I'll do the introductions. So if my sound guy over there can do his magic. Hey folks, my name is Charles Madden, but known around the inner city of Sydney as Chicka. That's a nickname that I got many, many years ago going to Redfern Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre for Indigenous Excellence. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land, that's the land we're on at the moment. For many, many years I've been involved different Aboriginal organisations in and around the city. I've been a director with the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, where I am still a very active member. Folks, I'd like to take this opportunity today to extend a warm and sincere welcome to any of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters who may have travelled here onto Gadigal land, if you have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Strait or further afar across the seas, welcome, welcome to Gadigal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Orkesbury River to the north, the Peen to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Once again, welcome, welcome, and welcome to Aboriginal Sydney. <laughs> Thank you, and I'd also like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Aboriginal land, and we always like to remind ourselves that this um, always was a place of learning. Long before the sandstone was built into the quad and all that sort of stuff, it's always a place of um, sharing and, and learning and, and sharing knowledge. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about the MOOC, um, because I know we've got a lot of uh, um, people from overseas here, um, and I'd like to welcome our visitors from the Asia Pacific Rim University's leadership program that are here, and I think you're the big group in the middle there, so welcome and thank you for coming tonight. They've been working with Amy and Mikey from our centre over the last couple of days, so it's great to see you here. Um, and so I'm and I know as part of their program they had to do a little bit of the MOOC. Is there anybody here who hasn't done the MOOC or doesn't know what the MOOC is? Or all my friends down the front can put their heads up. <laughs> okay, so I'll just do a little um, a little intro about that. Um, not to you know make it all about that, but just so you know what we're talking about. Um, so um, we're going to play the trailer for the MOOC. So this is um, an online open access course that is available to anybody around the world. Um, it's free, although you can pay for a certificate, and we'll just play the trailer to explain it a bit more. When you think of Sydney, what images come to mind? When you think of Aboriginal peoples, what do you think of? Sydney is a city rich in diverse pre-colonial, colonial and contemporary sites of significance to Aboriginal peoples. But too often, when we think about Aboriginal people, our images of a stereotypical ancient past. Where they are, Sydney Harbour, is like the birthplace of colonisation here. And a lot of people have a perception that the real Aboriginal people aren't here. What we're showing them is that we survived. Not only did we survive, we thrive here. Sydney always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Despite this, often, the Aboriginal presence is invisible to non-Indigenous people. I genuinely believe there's still, uh, you know, major problems within the education system and my work is very much this search for historical truth. In relation to native title, one of the most interesting things is stone tool artefacts. 
in, even in Sydney, there's no shortage. There's quite literally tons of stone tool artifacts just buried beneath the surface. This course is an exploration of the key themes and capabilities of cultural competence, using Sydney as a case study to bring to light marginalised narratives of Aboriginal presence in this space. There is a way back into the minds of Sydney Aboriginal people because the people themselves are starting to use their language again and they're looking at ways of building the language so that they can talk about being Aboriginal Sydney people. By the end of this course you will have developed a deeper and multi-layered knowledge and understanding about Aboriginal peoples, cultures and places in Sydney. You will also develop a greater understanding of how history, cultures and places are represented contested and interpreted, and learn how to relate this knowledge to your own context. Now I want them to go and tell that story. When they tell that story, they're showing appreciation for us, they're breathing life into us as, as our culture, and when they, when they go out, they become connected to what we're telling them. So they get connected to thousands of years of this land. So it was, it's just been launched for just over a year now. It's been incredibly successful. Um, we have nearly 3,000 people signed up for it. And if everybody in this room signs up, we might get to the 3,000. Um, the completion rate is quite high. It doesn't look high because you kind of think, oh, 454. But in MOOC terms, that's actually quite high. It's about 16, 15, 16 percent. It fluctuates um, depending on who, you know, how quickly people complete. So we're very happy with it. Um, the other big success of it is that we've just turned it into an internal course for the University of Sydney. So the, uh, the MOOC version, we have about 65 people from Australia and the rest are all from overseas. Um, <laughs> anything else? Um, <laughs> and uh, so we have a huge, and so it was kind of, yeah, everybody please turn your phones off. Um, sounds off, phones off, we're good to go. Uh, so it's been, it was designed to be um, accessible for anybody anywhere in the world. And so we put the cultural competence lens on. So we use Aboriginal Sydney as a, as a kind of case study to get people looking at who their Indigenous peoples are and their First Nations people and how it impacts on the way they see or don't see um, their environment. So we're very happy with how it's gone. Um, and these are just, you know, I'm just bragging now. Humble brag. Not really humble, actually, is it? It's just a big brag. Um, but the feedback we've got from students has been really um, great. And I think, you know, when you start these things, um, this was one of the first that the University of Sydney actually developed. And you never know, do you, how it's going to go. Um, but we've been really happy with um, the learning that people have had. And we know that organisations are getting all their staff to do it. Um, there's a real gap there for quality knowledge around Aboriginal Sydney and more generally. And one of the strengths of this um, course is that it's entirely um, Aboriginal people telling their stories. So Gadigal people and people who've come to live on Gadigal country. Um, and it's a mix of community, academics and um, people who do this work for their job. So um, it's been really great. We have a long list of um, contributors. It's all video driven. And if you haven't um, enrolled, you really must go and enrol. But the people on the panel were all contributors to the MOOC. Um, they've probably forgotten now. It was a while ago now where we actually filmed. They've probably forgotten what they did contribute. But I'd just like to introduce them. Um, so we've got Auntie Jenny Co Munro, who um, is well known as a, an amazing activist and um, fighter for Indigenous and human rights, um, and actually won an award for that. The was it the Eddie Marbo Human Rights Indigenous Social Justice Rights? The yeah. I get it right in a minute, the National Indigenous Human Rights Award in 2015, but very well known for her activism, um, an original founder of the Aboriginal Housing Company and still fighting for housing and other um, Indigenous rights, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. Dave Beaumont from the City of Sydney, the um, Indigenous uh, Community Engagement Coordinator, um, a Rajari man, and John Mundine, um, who is a really well-known, internationally famous art curator. I should declare he is also my brother-in-law. Um, but he's not here because he's my brother-in-law. He's here because he's amazing at what he does. So um, thank you all for coming. We are also expecting Nathan from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, but um, he's been held up or something's happened, so we're not sure yet. But he'll either come in or he won't. So um, that's really good. So um, 
I'd just like to ask you all to introduce yourselves a little bit and tell us something about who you are and how you came to be doing the kind of work and the activism or whatever it is that you're doing and tell us a bit about how you came to do that. We'll start with you, Auntie Jenny. Oh yeah, and the mic, sorry. Yep. Probably. Hello. Yeah. Um, my, um, I'm sorry, I'll start at the beginning. I am a Wiradjuri woman. Um, um, I come from a little mission called Urambi in a town called Cowra. Hello. Hello. I probably haven't got it close enough there, sorry. So I come from a mission called Urambi, which is just um, sits on a hilltop outside the town of Cowra. Um, we call it, fondly amongst ourselves, 32 acres, because that's the extent of the land that we own, that's there at that place, Urambi, 32 acres of land. In the scheme of things, when you think of Aboriginal people in this country, Wiradjuri people in particular, our country basically starts from the mountains west. So we basically occupy the southern half of New South Wales, Wiradjuri people in land of the mountains, and Kamilaroi, the northern part. They're the two biggest tribal populations in the country and the two biggest land masses. So when you hear about Mr. people like Mr. Pearson representing his community and being an acknowledged leader, we have bigger families and they have tribes and clans. Um, I came to this job, this work, um, as a very young girl. I was 17 when my brother and sister, Paul and Isabel, who were heavily involved in the 1972 embassy in Canberra, came through home on the way to Canberra. And um, I convinced my parents to let me go. The, the catch in the deal was that they came and the younger siblings came too. So I saw the embassy when it was established and we were also there when um, it was declared overnight. It went from a peaceful legal occupation of land to an illegal, illegal occupation overnight when they passed the legislation saying it was illegal to camp on Commonwealth land. So I was there also when I saw the federal police come around the corner, marching towards us to um, pull the embassy down. We were, I was there the second and the third time when they did that. Now this was in 1972. There was no such thing as a mobile phone. Land violence were just uh, probably being um, first used by our people. Um, Within that month of July in 1972, our people gathered in Canberra three times. Um, I think the third, probably about the 14th, 15th, and then the last week of July when that um, last scene was played out. Now, if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you look at a film called Ningla Anna, done by the Cavadini brothers in 72. They actually lived at the embassy at the time that they filmed that, so it's all factual stuff on the ground as it happened and that's the benefit of uh, a film like Ningarana. Um, I'm not actually seen in the visuals of the film but my name is called out about the process where my brother was being assaulted and why um, he had to intervene with the police when they were assaulting me. So Paul ended up in the hospital in a pretty serious condition that night, my brother, because he copped it. I saw awesome, awesome examples of our people resisting the police on that day. I don't know if you know of him, but a man called Tiger Bales hails from Queensland, part of the Watson family, a very big group. I saw that man swing a baseball bat for about an hour, just in a circle, and there was no federal copper brave enough to come in that circle. They just swung the bat and kept them all away from him. <laughs> but a lot of our people got assaulted besides myself and my brother that day and that sadly is the template for Aboriginal and police relations in this country and it hasn't changed one iota. Um, that actually put me on my um, career path just at the embassy. I then came to Sydney and worked in the organisations <coughs> that my brother and sister were involved in, Aboriginal Legal Service, Medical Service. 
and then became involved in founding member of the housing company, for example, founding member of Marowena, for example, founding member of Tapalpa, the bail house, for example, founding member of Aboriginal Children's Service. Uh, okay, I'm pretty loud. I mean, can you get, I can get loud if you want. <coughs> this thing just gets in my way and annoys me after a while. Um, so, I did a lot of the groundwork in our local community and setting up community-based organisations, and that was part of my education. Um, I am privileged to have people in my family like Auntie Shirley Smith, who's my grandmother's sister. So I was mentored by Auntie Shirley when I first came to Sydney as a young and naive 17 year old. And the first thing she told me was to shut my mouth until I know my material. So I wasn't allowed to even speak publicly for about the first six or seven years. I was learning my craft and being mentored by a woman that had gone into the jails in the 50s and created this thing called a field officer by the work that she did in the jails. She taught all the field officers at the legal service in the 70s how to be field officers, how to go into the jails, how to go into the institutions that are so obviously and completely racist at that time that we weren't even allowed in the door. I'm talking about hospitals, police, real estate agents, if there's anyone old enough in the room, and there's a few grey hairs, not just me, remember, remember that time in the early 70s. Um, you know, if you think you got it bad now as part of political movements, you ain't seen nothing compared to the, the violence that was inflicted upon our people systemically, and still is being inflicted upon our people st systemically by the system. So I had magnificent teachers, one hell of a brief, and I tried to cover it by working to our strengths, community-based organisations where we actually have a voice and we articulate our governance in our fashion. So that's where I come from. Don't know where I'm going. <laughs> We won't fight over that. <coughs> um, my name is John Mundine, or Mundine, and uh, Jenny and our family, and geez, as a check-in sort of career, a uh, check-in relationship. And you know, they say, what do they call it? Uh, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your relatives. And my relative, and uh, John, just so they hold the places for different I Yep. Hello. Yep. Cool. We're back. Yeah, give me that one. Sorry. Hello. It works so well when we practice. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we, I belong to uh, a pretty prominent family, uh, not maybe as prominent as the Coes. I think that um, um, call the Mundine family, who are prominent for a number of things. Something in Western society, they say there's three ways you can achieve immortality. One of those is that you uh, you can fight like in a war, you can um, achieve at sport, or you can achieve uh, as a writer or an intellect. And uh, that's Western society. Uh, but implicit in that is, of course, that you work with your community. And uh, I... Th think you've got to work with your community otherwise it's a, the rest of that being a, a an individual hero is isn't uh, something that we uh, well I don't believe in that Aboriginal people should believe in a, as individuals um, I was born uh, I think the day I was born I became aware of Aboriginal cultural things and I've lived in and worked in the cultural and art field um, just accidentally. Uh, I never planned to do anything. I never 
set out to achieve anything. It just happened. Things came to me and you had to make decisions. Will I do this or that? Uh, and then you, make, you get good at making decisions for, and being responsible for your decisions. And although uh, culturally things, uh, we have this other idea of culture being high culture, something that's done at the opera house, etc. Well, I never believed in that. I think that culturally things have to happen at every level of your society, and certainly in Aboriginal society. And the thing Jenny was talking about with uh, prisons, etc. The fact that there aren't enough cultural activities in prisons. Um, the big question for Aboriginal people, I think, is the growing number of people that are being through uh, this bureaucratic practice. I think Robert Kennedy said something, the American uh, politician said that people can kill you with a, with a bureaucrat. A bureaucrat can kill just as good as a, someone with a bullet or a bomb uh, through bureaucracy and indifference and indifference in bureaucracy. So these things now you have, what is it, one third of all women prisoners in, a, in Australia are, are Aboriginal women. And just they, I just was stunned by that figure. And I said, well, what, what crime have they committed? What are they doing? What terrorist activity are they carrying out? Why are they, uh, what is their crime? And of course their crime is they're Aboriginal. As far as the society goes, they're Aboriginal and that's a crime and they need to be locked up. Now I'm saying that uh, in the reverse way. You have prisons in the Northern Territory now that are going to be wholly Aboriginal prisons where every member of those people is an Aboriginal person. In the juvenile system in the Northern Territory 100% of all the juveniles that are locked up are Aboriginal people, young kids. That's the, for me, that is the biggest um, um, not problem, it's the biggest huh? crime. it's the biggest crime it is the biggest crime but it's the biggest thing to work on uh, you talk about working on co in cultural matters, but that's the biggest thing for us to overcome or to work on and change, because that that is the next generation, and we've got to change that. Otherwise, it just becomes a repeating cycle. And um, I think we we've, we've done lots of things in the cultural world. I've seen lots of artists evolve. I've seen lots of our artists achieve things. I've seen lots of artists, dancers, singers, whatever, become famous, become uh, well known and achieve things. But if that, that, the rest of the society is in that position, as I've said, the next, that 100% of kids uh, in jail in the Northern Territory are Aboriginal, then we've, there's something, that's what we've got to work on. That's, a, that's the thing that's got to change. And this is 10, 12 years after the intervention. Yes, that's right. And and um, last week I did uh, not last week, two weeks ago I opened an exhibition about the intervention uh, in Melbourne at the Coonahan Gallery, and talking about ten years on since the intervention and how nothing has changed. It's only got worse. Uh, humans, uh, young people committing suicide has risen in the Northern Territory. I could, t I could tell you endless statistics that, um, that have gone backwards. And uh, I was in uh, an international place in a conference in uh, Bangladesh uh, earlier this year, and I told people about the intervention. And uh, I was with a group of other Aboriginal people and I started to tell them about oh, when the army and the police occupied Aboriginal lands. And uh, these Norwegian people were just stunned and said, we, we've never heard of this. Uh, that's impossible, we've never heard of this. And I had to try to explain to them, this is what happened in, in Australia in our lifetime. And unfortunately in Aboriginal arts, 
people are making these protest artworks, etc. But they're always talking about Captain Cook or they're talking about something that happened 200 years ago. There was an exhibition at the National Gallery that happened last year, I think, or the year before, called Resisting Empire. There were 30 contemporary Aboriginal artists in that exhibition who contributed work and were chosen to be in there. Uh, they made artworks about resisting empire. Not one of those artists or those artworks talked about the intervention about the Australian army occupying Aboriginal lands in their life, in our lifetime. And it just stunned me that people, uh, this, you know, it's, um, it'd be like if we were invaded by another country and it was never appeared in the press. It, um, it was just amazing trying to tell these people this is what happened in our lifetime. And so that's what I, <clears throat> I've held, organised a number of exhibitions um, because I can't get into the press. You could write articles about this and no one will publish it. Uh, so uh, the one way is to put the exhibitions on, the things that in sympathetic uh, places like the Cunahan Gallery, which is a uh, left-wing sort of uh, radical art uh, exhibition space and uh, in places here in Sydney about the intervention and uh, that's my uh, contribution and try and then by writing catalogue essays uh, that's one way of publishing um, and mentioning of things like this. Now it is NAIDOC week and we're supposed to celebrate uh, uh, being um, in such a wonderful place uh, here, I guess. We're still alive, I guess. We're still uh, here and I'm able to make these statements. And we're all able to make this conversation, get this conversation to happen. But it's, um, it's just, it could be depressing, but at least the positiveness that I think you've got to think about is that I can still do these exhibitions I can still organise people of like mind to make these statements. Thanks. Um, my name is Dave Beaumont, but that's my foster name. My mum was Carol Smith, Wiradjuri, Central West New South Wales. My family. I know. I know. <laughs> We all are. Uh, so I still carry Beaumont in respect of my family, my non-Indigenous family, for the intention, the courage that they had at the time, and the opportunities of which I knew little about until this tsunami that Auntie Jen and Uncle John had touched on. So before I go any further, my acknowledgement to my elders, to country, is for the sacrifices that our elders made and the paths that they have forged keeping our culture alive, keeping our communities together for the benefit of this nation. And I know I'm jumping around here. One of the things that um, Gabrielle's asked me is, what's the legacy? In my humble opinion, I'm an eternal optimist. In my humble opinion, we are a good nation. My aspirations is that we should be, we could be, and we would be a great nation. When we look through the lens, that lens being First Nations lens, you will see a very different picture. 
And when you think about the metaphor of the person who they say is a captain, who I believe is actually not a captain, was a Lieutenant Cook. How did he navigate his way here, folks? He did it through one lens. He did it via the stars. What have our people been doing for tens of thousands of generations with cosmology, with the stars? The more you know, the more you don't know. So the more you learn here, theoretically that needs to open you up. Our living cultures come from a descriptive narrative. Western ideology is a prescriptive narrative. Put simply, the laws of our universe are exactly that. Our culture defines and refines us. We don't define and refine it. With all due respect to the major art institutions, our art's painted on the floor. Mother Nature is the greatest storyteller of all. Our living cultures, you see what I'm saying, living cultures, is a direct reflection of that. When practiced the way it is and was intended, it has true meaning. It's not meaning to be true. If it's meaning to be true, folks, I call it artificial intelligence. And you know why? Because what underpins iterations of our culture, whether it's dance, performance, in any way, shape or form, poetry, painting, you name it. We have endless forms of those iterations. What underpins that? It's not what you see, it's what you don't see. And what underpins those iterations of our culture is what I call the sacred geometry. The sacred geometry, folks, the ideology, the wisdom, the mythology, the values, the systems. Those are the things that present themselves. So if I use the metaphor of art, how many people walk into a fancy office and you see the stereotypical, more often than not, central desert artwork? If I take away the narrative, <laughs> In other words, the story. You see little two little pieces of paper beside that artwork. What do you think happens if I take away the narrative and the authenticity? Devalues it, doesn't it? So my role at the city, in essence, is a conduit for our elders who have fought for the rights but it's also our responsibility as Aboriginal people to practice culture in that transition of knowledge and keeping all those beautiful essence of our culture alive, because they're there. So my little journey, I was born here, anyone heard of the block? I was born on the block. <laughs> I'm a block baby. <laughs> I was talking to another aunt there somewhere along the line and said, what should do? block baby coffee book. <laughs> I never got to meet my mum, folks. She drank herself to death. You know the gift she gave me? It's going to sound pretty strange, this. M42A. You know what that is? That's my mitochondrial strain. You know what that is? That's my DNA, folks. 
every prescriptive law in this country saw fit to overtly and covertly take me, strip me, gets emotional, and hang me out to dry. But something was always in me. That M42A takes me back 50,000 years. That's my bloodline, folks. Dare say very similar. The thing in this country is that comes from your mother. The bloodline of your indigenous heritage comes from your mother. And didn't they know that too? They knew that. So as a kid, growing up on the other side of the harbour, anyone heard of Mossman? Yeah. Can you imagine the dichotomy between Redfern, the block in the 70s? I was born in 69, right? <laughs> and finding myself over in this place called Mossman. And I'll never forget it, probably about the age of seven. Why are you a different colour to your brothers and sisters? That started my journey. Then at the age of 13, I went to a Catholic boarding school. St. Joseph's College at Hunters Hill. So I just said talk about punishment, yeah. Yeah, the only Indigenous kid there at Joey's. Yeah, it was a form of torture. To which my foster mother said many years later, Dave, actually when we took you there, one of the brothers said, don't worry Mrs. Beaumont, we know how to handle his type. So I spent three years in that place. I went there from year eight to year 10. You know what? I'm actually thankful for that passage of time now. Back then, whoa, I learned two things. Nature of the beast and survival of the fittest. But what that did was also, and I'm gonna to start touching on this, I was very fit and very sporty. No one ever took beyond physically. That in itself was a form of defence. And so I used to say to myself, why do people attack me? And I realised, I had this epiphany. And we all know the saying, attack is the best form of defence. And that was the moment that I realised people attack us because they defend, they're trying to defend their ignorance. Right? So what I'm doing, folks, is just asking you to receive this in the spirit it's given. I mean no disrespect. I respect your cultures. I respect your intellect. And all I ask is you the same as reciprocated. It's a pretty, pretty simple equation. So that journey coming spat out of that place, <coughs> the tender age of 16, 17, I think I was, the little fire in my belly, who are you to tell me that my culture doesn't exist, yet allow people to mock me for the colour of my skin and then impose an education impose your ideology this little black duck don't like that so I left and that was the catalyst for me okay Dave smart ass you think you're so smart what are you gonna do now 
And again, I knew I had that energy and that fire. And I was angry for a very long time. And I realized that's toxic if I don't do something with it and channel it the right way. So I'm thankful for the Beaumonts for giving me that one in 20 million opportunity. That's what it is, folks. Mathematics is pure. Rhetoric is all lies. So as Unc said, careful what you digest, in a sense. So I had to set myself on a path. Who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? And in that, I can categorically say to you, my ancestors heard the call. Little old Redfern heard my call. All of a sudden, just after the riots in 2004, the Redfern Community Centre was built. Mm. I had no idea that the city of Sydney ran that centre. I was asked to do a workshop in there. That's how I'll get back into the community. I went, introduced myself. My agenda was to connect with Redfern and all I ever saw was the same stuff you ever saw. I had the same fear, the same trepidation, but you know what? I had the conviction to see it through and I went there. Long story short, in essence, I say what I do at the city now <coughs> is I work in basically our Aboriginal strategic direction. Put simply, and I know that sounds fluffy and very broad, but again with respect, I say, I didn't choose this job, this job chose me. And I'm not here to make the numbers up. So the reason I gave the mic to ladies first, and elders first. And the stories, I zip and I listen. And that's what I've done and that's what I will continue to do. And that is what my role I see with all humility is at the city. If we want to coexist, folks, we've got to co-create. Some pretty simple equations here. We will always be different it's how we celebrate those differences. Yeah. It's not what you see, it's what you don't see. And by that I mean, you might see plans and they're very seductive. I often say my role, when I'm there with a peachy, he's a, that's another big clan out, <laughs> the peaches. <laughs> yeah, but the peaches. He's my colleague. <coughs> I said, Preston, you know what? More often than not, we're managing people's intent. Their intentions, I have to take. Remember I said I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. I have to take that on merit and work with that intention. And I think when we are charting new waters, which we are at the city, That, of course, is going to bring new issues and challenges. Good, bad, ugly. I think we do the why well, but not the how. And what we try to do is present the valued proposition. I know what being <coughs> having imposition is like, so why would I want to impose on others? So I have to still live to those values. And no elder, no Aboriginal person 
ever turned me away from our culture, from our community, but many white people have. So I've got to learn these lessons and live true to that too. But as we, my philosophy going forward is to present the value proposition. So I'll give you an example. I'll just finish on this little note. Anyone heard of Einstein? Does anyone want to recite his definition of insanity? Go. Yeah, that's it. The definition of insanity via Einstein is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome, yeah? All right. So you all know, and apparently we took anthropologists to tell us this, <laughs> that blackfellas have the greatest peripheral vision of any human species on the planet. You know what I mean? We see further. We see further. We don't see a father, we see further. There's no God, in a sense, in our religion. There's no religion, mythology. So in that, I believe that our ancestors also fostered that innate physiological trait into our dreaming. Use the mind. Expand the mind. You've heard of Dadiri. Dadiri is the meditation. Far supersedes yoga and Buddhism. And I mean no disrespect. That's clocked at 5,000. Remember I said 40, 50,000 for me. Other elders there, we're talking 60, 70,000, possibly more. 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 See? So you can do the maths on that, folks. Yeah. So in little old Sydney town here, borrowing on that pretty out there concept and philosophy, how do we start to use this more? So when I came in the city, I'm going, hmm, well, haven't we been slaving to a deficit narrative for too long? Who made up that narrative? Well, I don't wake up in the morning and call myself dysfunctional, disadvantaged. So what we're doing at the city is we're just changing that narrative, folks. We're moving from the negative to the positive. We're framing everything in contributions, aspirations, achievements, prosperity, optimism. That then doesn't put the onus on me or anyone else. It puts the onus on all of us. Someone can't do everything, everyone can do something. There's the value proposition starting to come forward. Also, moving away from the continual reference of us in the past tense. Aboriginal people were. Aboriginal people when. Aboriginal people then. Well, there's four or five of us in the room here now. We were then and we're still here and we're still here for the future. So we're moving away from the deficit. We're moving away from the past tense. Again, if we want to coexist, we've got to co-create. Bring the value proposition. Let's start working together. So that's me. Thank you all for um, sharing so much of your story and how you came to be here. Um, there's many things I could ask you, but I'll bring it back to the NAIDOC Week theme to start with, um, because of her we can. And a lot, all of you mentioned the women in your life, and um, and you would be one of the women that people would feel inspired, and because of you, they can. So I'd ask each of you to talk about who are the women that you can say, because of her, I can and I do. Um, onto Jenny, if you'd like to start. I think I gave you a pretty good heads up earlier. Uh, I'm sure Shirley Smith was probably one of the most inspirational people that you could ever meet, regardless of colour. Um, 
she walked into the Catholic Church up there, the cathedral, and tell the bishop to fuck off. And that was the, the brilliance of her. She was, uh, she called herself the Mad Roman Catholic. She would literally have these verbal stouches with priests, with bishops, about <laughs> his place and a lot of other things. Is yeah, but the thing about um, me and my aunt is surely different, differed on one subject. It's pretty obvious what the subject was. Religion. Mm. Yeah. Um, I couldn't understand her easy obedience to an alien god and an alien religion. Um, she couldn't understand my deep faith in our religion. So we contested that for quite a few years, but we ended up agreeing to disagree, I think. Um, she took on that Catholicism as a way to do her work, really. Um, <coughs> the people that were most at hand to help her were nuns and priests and other people in the community. There were two sisters that actually lived at the block uh, that were part of an order that literally drove my auntie around the country and uh, facilitated any and all needs that she had during that time. Uh, we forget about people like Father Ted Kennedy um, because we've lost him. They had a very deep and spiritual relationship and Ted would not do anything without first discussing it with Aunty Shirley and second getting, second getting Aunty Shirley's permission before he did anything. So. I didn't understand why she took on that religion, but um, <coughs> respected, like I said, that was what we agreed to disagree on, religion. Uh, I was blessed with uh, Aunty Shirley's sister, my grandmother. Uh, she was a very, very, very strong woman, my mother's mother. Uh, she had polio as a young woman. <coughs> Um, so one leg was shorter than the other. She had to um, use a crutch all her life to walk, just to be able to walk properly. Um, she had to come to Sydney when her children were young. Um, and that's when the removal, I mean, the, the agents of the state moved in and took her three youngest children and they ended up, uh, my two uncles at Kinchula and my auntie at Kitamundra Girls Home. Um, and Nin Wedge was always my stalwart um, and I saw how she operated. She didn't have to move out of her house where we lived on the mission. All, everything came to her in her house. All the information about what was going on in the mission and everything else, all the important information came to her in the house from people that came. So. She didn't have to walk outside her door to know what was going on all around her. She knew constantly. And that's how matriarchs do their stuff. She was a great example of a matriarch for me, my, grand my mother's mother. This is on our country. So I have a history from my mother, I have a history of her mother, and that history of that land that we occupy at Cowra called 32 Acres and the history of the people that fought to keep that little bit of land. Now when you consider the whole of Wiradjuri country, 32 acres is not even a hair on your eyelash when you're blinking, it's not anything. But that was what white people decided we would only get out of all of our lands in that particular place. So, uh, my grandmother, I suppose, taught me resistance of empire. I like that. I'm going to use that from here on in because that's what we have been doing, resisting empire since it came. We're not British. We don't want to be British. My grandmother had no, no idea where Britain was. She just knew it was a bad place full of bad people. They should have stayed there. Um, she didn't get very far in school, but she had more wisdom in her little finger than I've seen very learned and academic people that are fools, can't walk out the door straight. I mean, common sense, there should be a university to do degree in common sense, because a lot of people are missing it. 
And she had oozed common sense, oozed it. And it's the life she had to live that she learnt through that extremely difficult existence every day of your life, every minute of your life. And I liken that to our traditional punishments. We use violent, violence in our system, but it was controlled violence, controlled aggression all the time. It's not this mad, wanton stuff that you fellas do where you kill thousands of people because some fella here don't like some fella there. All them people in the middle will get dead. No, that's not a good way to do it. Um, you know, we had fights in our country, on our country, but our fights really in the main, we didn't fight over land, I can tell you that. So that took away 90% of the problem, okay? What we were left with was what we fought over, women. <coughs> Good breeding stock, okay? That's what the battles were, brother, over. And I tell you, we didn't worry about water or food when the men were looking for women. <coughs> Straight across country. My family follows the Kalea River, which is the Lachlan in your language. The marriage line straight across the country. Don't worry about water when you're <laughs> looking for the vitals in life. So they've taught me more than, you know, I've done your, your universities and your institutions. They've taught me more in five minutes than those places have in 10 years. And that's the deep wisdom that comes from that lived experience from our people. They lived those hard yards and they had to work out the solution on the hop for the very sake of survival, for us to still keep be here. So for me, at the end of the day, I thank all the women that came before me on my bloodline. Because if it wasn't for them, I sure as hell wouldn't be here. And I thank in particular the closest of those women that are on that bloodline because they are the ones that nurtured and taught me directly. And I will do what they did for me. I nurture and teach the next generation of women coming along to prepare them for the, the journey. Because um, in 2018, uh, living black in Australia, it ain't easy. It ain't been easy since that bastard that I call Crook came in. I have a deep love and respect for the Hawaiians because they killed the bastard. What we should have did here. Do you understand the damage that that man even did with his sailors? 80% of him on his boat with syphilis. 80% of the sailors on the boat with syphilis. Unleash him here. Obviously, the result was obvious. It was always going to be that result. So tell me where the civility was with those syphilated men coming here and raping our women and spreading that disease amongst us. No, no history in our culture of syphilis prior to white men coming here. Have a good look, all you scientists. We were a good people that lived a good life on good country. Today we say good country when we talk about a country, but we, talk, we say funny cattle when we talk about the people on it. There are a lot of funny cattle on our, on our country now. It shouldn't be there. Hard hoof animals have changed the very landscape of our continent from one end to the other. We, we walk barefoot for a reason. We didn't have to be shot didn't need shoes. The burn-offs and the land management, we managed the thistles, the bindi eyes. They were burned off, so you didn't have a problem. You've got bindi eyes everywhere today now because you fellas don't know how to handle them. That's why you got to wear shoes now. But before you came, we didn't have that problem. Soft earth everywhere. You've hardened the soil like you've hardened us. We've survived it, the soil survived it. What you need to do now is repatriate that soil, get it back to a healthy condition. So stop walking on it with your hard hooves for a start. 
change, fix the things that have been damaged in your time here. If you want to leave the world a better place, be active about making the changes, the damage that's been done. It's got to be undone environmentally. We cannot sustain any lifestyle if we keep on destroying the planet. Get rid of those people in the in your parliament houses down there who are not governing for anyone or anything but their own interests. This country's been, it's like in the toilet bowl, that big lump of turd that won't go down. Just keeps going around and around and around and around and around and around. That's governance in Australia today. That piece of turd just going around and around and around and around. Tell me, where's your leaders there? Where is your... Where are your charismatic leaders? Malcolm? Bill? Throw a few of the others in. There's no charisma there anywhere. It's just pure, unadulterated greed. And you think they're good people, good enough to run this country. Rack off. You have the wrong intention, for a start. It's about personal greed. Get out of it. Running it. Running something like that is not about what you get out of it, it's what you give to it. And they don't give nothing. They do a lot of taking for their own benefit. I mean, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. That past Deputy Prime Minister locked the bastard up. I mean, he's broken family values while he's dutting his bit on the side. Talk about hypocrisy writ large. I don't know if you know what dudding is. But no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, take send Barney be back to where he come from, over the fucking ditch. I mean, New Zealanders wouldn't put up with him. They'd say just straight up, you can keep him. <laughs> we don't want him. But we shouldn't be subjected to that sort of stupidity from a supposedly intelligent man. I know where he wears his intelligence. It ain't here. Okay? It ain't. It's that obvious. And yet, <laughs> you fellas put him up on that pedestal. Hey, what a great guy. Finally, he's just that real redneck fellow we need. No, he's not. He's the last thing you need. You got him. How are you going to get rid of him now? You're going to facilitate the mistress and the baby now and the ex-wife and the four kids? Because what a shit ass of a man. Cut his dick off. <laughs> yeah, I called him Barnacle Joyce. You couldn't get rid of him, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I just had to do a quick time check. We've only got like 10 minutes. Oh, God. Sorry. Right. 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 I was going to say, who mentioned it? But you and it's so on the point with uh, women, I think. Mm -hmm. so, well, the treatment of women. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry, but the thing about us is that we'll cut that down straight away. I'm all yeah. right. Women, you don't, yeah. don't be no arrogant, good looking man coming here because you'll be put in your place. That's and true. Garage will shrink. And I think, anyway, there's two, uh, <laughs> you, were, you uh, said this time, <laughs> two things that you were alluding to, two Australian sayings. Uh, about our political system and uh, leadership. And, uh, one is, um, sorry, one is of course that shit floats and uh, on the surface, and the other is of course that you can only polish a turd so much. <laughs> um, and that's that's the, our political system. That's a scale your word and it happens every electoral cycle. Well. And the women in your life. And uh, so the thing is, uh, here we were in New South Wales, that's what it's called, it's a structure called New South Wales now. But in this uh, district, the Gamilawoi and Wiradjuri are largely the two big groups, and uh, I'm Bunjalung, another big group that actually goes off into, across the, what's now the Queensland border, but we go over that border in the north, north coast of New South Wales. On my mother's side, uh, she's gone bang here from around Nambucca Heads. And that family, her family, were very politically involved 
in a large uh, Aboriginal political party that was started really about the time of the First World War. And that uh, group of people, my grandmother and my grandfather, uh, that's my mother's parents, they uh, were very active in that uh, political party. Uh, they were uh, very sophisticated people and they lived in another time when people, we have no rights and we're oppressed now. Well, they certainly had no rights and were oppressed then. Um, they conversed, they wrote letters to the um, Marcus Garvey in America uh, and his uh, Negro Improvement uh, Organisation, as he called it, that had was a large, really large political movement within the United States in the 1920s. And they set up their political party uh, along the same lines of equality and uh, for uh, black people <clears throat> and the oppressed and uh, and to improve people's lives. And from that, uh, my mother's side, I learned um, to be that, that saying that uh, everything you do is a political act, and it is. And I come to believe that, and I live my life like that, that everything you do is a political act. My cousins in that uh, group uh, from that area, Gumbanga, around, um, them back ahead, uh, two really strong people who remain friends uh, as I've grown up, uh, Gary Foley and Gary Williams. Gary Williams now lives back in them back ahead and is very active in that community. Uh, there are lots of other people in that community too who are very politically activated. And uh, my sisters, I live in a family I came to live in a family of seven brothers and three sisters and I talked about ways to achieve immortality or some meaning in life. My eldest brother, who's the eldest of my family, he uh, joined the Australian Army uh, because the only job he could find in Grafton, we were born in Grafton, uh, he uh, was well known all over the town. He was this happy person. He was a really good football player. He was known right through the town. But the only job he could get was sweeping up uh, in a factory. And uh, he had a woman who was a teacher, a white woman there, who saw him and said, well, who, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, this is my job. I've got a job here. And she <coughs> took him, uh, just said, get out of here and she took him down to the, uh, uh, there was an army recruitment office and he signed up and became a soldier. And that made his life from that action. She just said, you're wasted, this is crap, you're staying here. And he signed up, he said within a week he was down here at uh, <coughs> Victoria Barracks in Sydney within another couple of weeks. He was at Pakapanyal training and within a couple of months he was actually in Malaya uh, in active duty. And uh, he said his life took off. He met lots of other people overseas. He traveled widely. Um, but that's the kind of job you might be pushed into with the costume of being shot at and being killed and whatever. Uh, that kind of life, but that's a shit life, but that's one way to break free and get respect in, a, in this society. My three sisters then um, were really active and wanted to do things. So they signed up for a thing called the Rural Bank, uh, which is now part of Westpac really. And my sister, my eldest sister, when she, they're all dead now, uh, they are. They, um, 
she signed up, uh, she was had an opportunity to become an apprentice, like an apprenticeship with the Royal Bank. But in order to do that, she had to leave home. She had to come to Sydney. So she came to Sydney. Uh, that became a bit, a bit of a sore point within our family. Uh, but they, she convinced my mother that uh, she would be safe here. She wasn't even going to be raped and murdered and whatever uh, down here. And she found friends, other women, in fact, who were students at Sydney University amongst the Jewish families of Sydney and she originally boarded with them. She then uh, found a uh, Chinese woman uh, was also uh, one of the apprentices for the rural bank. Uh, they were going on this scheme of employing other people, not only white Australians, so they were employing Aboriginal women and women too, not men, and this uh, Australian-born Chinese woman. And she came to live with uh, that Chinese family as well. Um, and she convinced my second sister to take that, that uh, fellowship, uh, apprenticeship, and she came and joined them. And they lived in, uh, curiously, in another route to Redfern, uh, that Chinese restaurant was actually in Redfern uh, a long time ago now, before the dinosaurs died, uh, as it was. And uh, my younger sister then also became an apprentice with the rural bank and came to live here in Sydney. Uh, they all uh, were trained as uh, tellers and so on, and they learned their trade really well in office work and... Uh, and, and honesty and dealing, fair dealing with people. They eventually then though weren't just uh, going to go be assimilated into white society, <laughs> living with a Chinese family in a Chinese restaurant, but they, um, they uh, were active, became active in Aboriginal affairs uh, here. This is a very active time that Jenny was describing about all these things were happening. The, um, the Aboriginal Legal Service and so on, all these things, Aboriginal Health Service, all these things were coming into being. You know, uh, that, that influx of our aid, our generation, was yeah. in Sydney too. You know, yeah. Wasn't it? Our high school, we've gone yeah. as far as we could within the education system, but there was no work in that country town. Yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. That's why, that's that's why I end up here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> but, uh, so they became uh, involved in many things. And the, my family's a funny family, I guess, in a way, well, it's an Aboriginal way, I guess, that my father uh, lived away in, um, in the Second World War. He went and uh, he didn't join the army, but he was, uh, took up a, co he was with a contractor, construction contractor, and he uh, traveled to the Northern Territory in fact, and they built airfields and roads, the Darwin to Catherine, Alice Springs to Catherine Highway. They worked on that. They worked on Darwin Airport, etc. And he always believed that as children, we had to go and build our own road. We had to make our own path <coughs> and not worry. We were always, as they say, he said, uh, you can always come home. If you fail, or you think you failed, you can always come home. So what happened is, all of us have led very disparate lives, including my sisters, in coming here to Sydney. Well, we all still lived in Grafton. And so they were doing all these amazing things down here, and uh, not only our achievement in the bank, but then outside of that, in Aboriginal affairs, and being involved in a wide range of people that enriched my life, enriched all of our families' lives. We come to meet, um, through that Chinese connection, we come to meet the, these women that were the princesses of, of Malaya. They were the prince of, princess of Johor and all these other people, women turned up to their birthday parties, etc. And we lived a, a much richer life because of that. 
And when my <coughs> the, um, youngest sister died uh, only last year, um, I had to say that, la uh, that you've, what, what you find is they d went this other pathway and you'd suddenly go somewhere. I did uh, a large exhibition in rural Victoria in Healesville and I met um, Joy uh, Murphy, uh, one of the Aboriginal elders of that place down there near uh, Corrinburg, in fact, um, yeah, Corrinburg out in uh, rural Victoria. And um, uh, one of the things that people, I always thought, well, I was successful, I'm reasonably famous, I've d done all this stuff, etc. Um, and all these women uh, there uh, came up and they didn't say, you're the famous curator. Uh, they said, uh, you must be Kay's brother. And um, it's always been humbling that no matter where I go, I'm only halfway down the family chain. And most of my, all my sisters were above me. And uh, people would say, oh, you must be Olive's brother. Or you must be related to Anne or Kay. Like that. And that brings you down that these other people have done things before you. And uh, they said... Um, uh, they said, oh, Kay taught us everything we know. And you uh, are inspired by this. You can't help but in be inspired and humble about whatever you do or whatever you think you've done. And those, uh, my um, three sisters, uh, are those people that have led me uh, to do and live and be active as I am. Thank you. Well, can I just be quick? Yeah, yeah. yeah just be quick. Um, Jenny, well, what I just said there now, just want to clarify too, I'm calling Auntie Jenny, Auntie Jenny, and Uncle John, Uncle John. So for those of you who don't know what that actually is, they're not my aunties and their uncles. <laughs> That's a term of respect. <laughs> For me, I don't impose that on others. That's my term of respect for them. For, again, as I said, the sacrifices they've made in the paths they've forged. Um, although I only did meet her very briefly a couple of times, uh, and I'll also refer to her as Annie Kay, if I may, I'm actually in the role that she was at the City of Sydney. There you go. So I'm going to leave you three little things here and probably, um, you know, you, you'll see where I'm coming from with this, uh, you know, let's, let's delve into some possibilities that each and every one of us has. The education, folks, is something that is holding us back. Yes, you heard what I said, education. There has been one narrative that has been imposed on you, on us. And again, that's your invitation if you see fit. <laughs> Welcome to the first day of the rest of your life with all humility. I'm just going to point out three other things that guide me. And then a bit more worldly. One is Mother Teresa. And she said, if we judge people, we have no time to love them. Michelangelo, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. I see the angel in the concrete jungle and I'm carving until I set it free. That angel is everything that embodies who we are pre-colonisation, now 
and what we will be celebrating in the future. Again, the eternal optimist. And the last one. Anyone ever hear of a lady called Condoleezza Rice? At one stage, she was pretty much one of the most powerful women on the planet, African American. And when she was in that, I think it was um, Secretary of State in America, might have been under Bush of all things, but um, she told a little story of when she was at university, you know, a minority within a minority, within a very white majority. And didn't she get to look down the nose? And here's what she said when no judgment here, strictly ob observation <coughs> and paraphrasing it best I can. A very big white gentleman walked up to her, looking down his nose at her. He was, you know, the sport guy, the academic guy. And he basically walked up to her and said, what are you doing here? And she looked around and she said, I speak five languages fluently. I play three instruments, classical instruments. I have four degrees. Now I'm picking those numbers, but not far off. And she finished by saying, I'm actually better at being white than you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> so look, I draw my strength from everywhere. I'm blessed, you know, what Auntie Jenny said, um, having, uh, I actually ended up living with an auntie for a while, Auntie Gloria Gray, I don't know if you remember her, yeah, yeah, that's my aunt, and, um, you know, what they did, yeah, oh, there we go, see, I know, all Central West, you know, she'd tell me, son, we'd get a phone call, no ifs or buts, you had to go five hours, you got the nearest mail, you drove out, you sorted the problem out, that was it, like Auntie Jenny was saying, you know. So for me, I'm really grateful that my spirit guided me back where I needed to be. I always want to remain open and learning and respectful, uh, and I will do that. And, um, but I also see the light at the end of the tunnel, the angel and the marble. And again, there's the dreaming. The dreaming isn't stagnant. John Lennon sang Imagine, I'll finish on this, I promise. John Lennon sang Imagine. Nelson Mandela never lost his vision for himself, his family, his culture, his community, his country, his world. What did, um, what did um, Gandhi say? Be the change you want to see. It's all about the vision, folks, and this is it. So what did Martin Luther King say? Come on. I have a dream. We come from the dreaming. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, and apologies for those of you who have to rush off. We have gone a little bit over time. Um, I actually have another 15 questions. I think I've got to ask two. Um, but fantastic powerful amazing people and stories and i thank you so much for coming here tonight and sharing yourself and your stories and your experiences and everything with us i think you'll all agree it's been fascinating and interesting and i know that there's probably a thousand questions out there um, but we will finish up without asking questions because i know people have to go um, i don't know if these guys could stay around just for a few minutes if people want to come and um, talk to them directly that would be fantastic um, but please um, join me in thanking them all very much for being here.